So I wanted to let this Union Life listeners know that I will be giving a two-hour online event that is sponsored by the Oregon Friends of Jung on October 15th at 7 p.m. Pacific Time. And it will be a lecture that explores the basic principles of Jungian dream work. And the next day there will be a workshop. And my title is Another Whom We Do Not Know, Dreams as the Voice of the Inner Companion. And I've been working with some really interesting material. I'm really excited about it. And I hope you'll come. So uh, we'll put the link in the show notes. Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian Life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we are going to circle around the concepts of justice and fairness, uh, because I think we all have a memory of being a five-year-old and shouting out to some adult, but it's not fair. And indeed, uh, we seem to be hardwired for a sense of what is fair, reciprocal, and is this a subjective perception, or are there some real uh, objective uh, sort of principles out there? Even primates are wired for what they perceive as fair. So somewhere there's some archetypal realities that we'll explore. Justice and fairness are also integral to a functioning society, and there are lots of ways that those principles of what's right and fair and just uh, have been conceived over time. And then there are the gods, uh, such as in Greek mythology and other systems, and what their ideas of fairness are versus man's perception of what is fair. Well, it strikes me that the idea of justice and fairness shows up in antiquity associated mostly with the gods, that the ancient god uh, Themis, as an uh, early Greek god who's uh, one of the children of uh, Uranus, was the giver of justice. She was the one who discerned whether or not a situation was appropriately balanced. And thus, many of the ancient goddesses held a scale in their hand to determine if something was equitable because it was balanced. So I'm thinking in some way that underlies much of our system of justice and fairness. So you have two kids and you give one kid an ice cream cone and the other expects an ice cream cone. And if they don't get one, it's not fair. The scales are not balanced. So we have a natural sense of this kind of equity, which is archetypal. 
Yeah, I think that's really interesting that that justice and fairness are based on this underlying concept of balance. Because we can also think about that intrapsychically. We talk all the time about how when we're out of balance in the psyche, we're in an erotic state. And that the psyche aims to self-regulate and to find balance. So we can be unbalanced in ourselves. For example, where perhaps we're giving too much weight to the ego perspective and not making room enough for the perspective of the unconscious. So it does seem like there's this very deep underpinning of this idea that we're reaching, we're striving for balance. I'm back on uh, your idea, Joseph, of equity, and that that is the level uh, that young kids seem to operate on of the, you know, wait a minute, he got an ice cream cone and I didn't, and that's not fair. And uh, that's the case in a in a study of um, monkeys, where the task for all the monkeys was to press a certain lever, and some were rewarded after pressing the lever with a piece of cucumber, and some were rewarded by being given a grape. And the grape, far more preferable, led to outrage amongst the monkeys who had done the same thing and only got cucumber, and they went on strike. Then they wouldn't do the- <laughs> pressing the lever anymore. So there was I, no, it was unmotivating mm-hmm. to see that others got rewarded differently. Yeah. And so that seems to be with the idea of balance and the scales of justice, ego and unconscious, of what is balanced, what is equitable as a basic, at least fundamental one concept of what is justice. Yeah, it's like we come into the world with an expectation that the world owes us at least what everyone else has. The other line along which justice and fairness has been constructed, I imagine this is fundamental, particularly in Western society, is the idea of merit or deservedness that if everybody is supposed to participate in a given project and some people work harder and do more than others, that those people deserve more than the people who slacked off or simply didn't have the skills, and that that's a more merit-based idea. And I think it's built into the American dream that, you know, everybody can pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. You work hard, put your nose to the old grindstone, and you'll be rewarded. It's funny that in a modern world that's complicated, I think this goes to some of the Marxist ideas that the workers should own the means of production because they're the ones who are putting enormous hours of their lives into the productions of things. And that the person at the top who simply owns the factory and then is living a life of leisure is not entitled. It's unfair for them to reap the benefit of the workers that are putting their sweat into it. So in the modern era, we have this new ways of distributing work that people who are intellectually, conceptually, or opportunistically generating ideas and putting that into the world and then enrolling other people to be the workers, the manifestors of their ideas in a capitalist system, that is considered a kind of fairness and equity because if the person who had generated the concept had not brought forward that talent, then the workers would not have had an opportunity to participate in manufacturing Mm-hmm. So it's a really complicated, subtle idea of who deserves what. But on a feeling level, I certainly understand that. You know, it's interesting that you went to communism, Joseph, because I think after what you said, Deb, I was sort of in a similar place. And what came up for me was how difficult it is for us to see injustice. It's painful to go out into the world and see uh, you know, as as the Buddha did uh, when he finally left the wonderful palace that he lived in to go out in the world and see that there were people who were suffering and that there's no there's no sense in it. 
it's 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 not it doesn't it doesn't make sense that I should have so much and be so comfortable while a few miles away people are really struggling and suffering. How do I make sense of that? And and I think it's the development of communism, I think in some senses a response to the incredible stratification of income and the suffering that was happening in industrializing Europe. Yeah. And a growing awareness of how unfair that was. And one of the things that we do sometimes when we see injustice is we try to rationalize it. So we say, well, I have more because I've worked harder, which, you know, may sometimes not be entirely without merit. I mean, these are really complicated things we're talking about. But certainly part of what that does is assuage any sense of guilt that we have for benefiting from injustice. And that goes to uh, the whole idea of distribution and distributive justice, which um, harks back to the Marxist thing that everybody, there's equity, everybody gets the same to each according to his needs. How are rewards distributed? Rewards, resources, opportunities, how are they distributed? We can cloak it in a sense of uh, we, we have it, therefore we must deserve it. And that takes me to the idea of monarchies and hierarchical systems, uh, which have been in place in, I would imagine, all human societies except perhaps very early hunter-gatherer uh, societies, but that there are hierarchical models of society where what the king says goes. But you know... I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, if you look at animals, there are hierarchies in animal societies. You know, if you, if you think of mountain gorillas, you know, there's the alpha male, the great, the giant silverback who kind of bosses everyone else around, you know. And it's not even just primates. All kinds of animals have, well, pecking orders mm -hmm. comes from chickens, you know, and, and as a, an erstwhile keeper of backyard poultry, I can attest <laughs> that that really happens. So it's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, I mean, it's, it's like, we don't like to admit it, but it just, it, it's a, there is a just soness to this. And in uh, families, there are certainly hierarchies. And um, thank goodness, because it would be uh, chaos if the two-year-old uh, ran the show. Walking around the word fair, in the back of my mind. And it seems to me that when children lament that something's not fair, that somewhere there's a rule inside of them. I don't know whether this is archetypal or part of social programming, but I think part of the fairness is that we're all playing by the same rules and that somebody is not breaking the rules. So if I remember playing Monopoly, you know, with my family, you know, it's not fair if somebody cheats, somebody decides that we're not going to all obey the same instruction booklet that came with the game. And so fairness seems to be predicated on common agreement as well. And the infraction of moving against the common agreement somehow warrants both a personal and an archetypal correction. Now, I don't know whether that's a social convention or something that we're hardwired to, but it seems like a level in the discussion. And this brings me back a little bit to the goddess Themis, whose name translates to mean tradition. So the book of rules, the tradition, the expectation what everybody agrees to in terms of common, acceptable behaviors, agreements, standards, is part of what's perceived as fair or unfair. And that really complicates the things and makes it particularly idiosyncratic and how it varies widely from culture to culture and family to family, for that matter. Joseph, to build on what you're saying, Piaget noted something that he called the concrete operational stage of child development in which children become very fixated 
on following the rules to the letter. So, so this is a kind of a normative aspect of development where we get very concerned about this. And that must have something to do with survival in a certain way that the culture begins to communicate to the children how we are going to be rewarded, how we're going to be kept safe, how we're going to be receiving resources as they're distributed. And so much about civilization itself is about laws and rules. I think the Code of Hammurabi was the kind of ancient, miraculous, very detailed document that is, I think, the first demonstration of a civilization that begins to say, this is permitted, and if you violate this rule, this is the repercussions. And uh, the level of detail that the Code of Hammurabi had was incredibly meticulous. So I, I want to try to sum up kind of what we've been talking about, because I think we've been roughly focusing on two things, which is the underlying archetypal basis for justice and fairness, the recognition that it exists in animals, that we co seemingly come into the world with an expectation of fairness, and then the way that it gets codified or interpreted or operationalized in a given culture, like you're saying, Joseph, with the Code of Hammurabi. And there's sort of uh, divine justice, the justice of the gods, and then there's justice at the level of the individual or the culture. And they're not always in alignment. I think they're, uh, in fact, sometimes they really conflict. I think that mythology is full of these kinds of stories, as are, is the Old Testament, other ancient texts, where human beings are besieged by what they feel is misfortune because they lack the perspective of the gods. So as human beings come against inexplicable suffering, accessing their intuition and their imagination, we try to create religious significance out of this suffering and develop ideas like karma, which comes from our Eastern brethren. The idea that there is a cosmic equilibrium that human beings are both subject to and participate in, which causes a kind of action in response to decisions, feelings, behaviors that we have made, and that the universe is compelled to initiate a compensatory process in service to maintaining equilibrium. And I would venture to say that underlies Jung's theory of why we dream. That dreams themselves, based on that definition, are a kind of justice. In as much as somewhere in each person's psyche, there is an image of wholeness, and that the ego's behavior, thoughts, feelings are compared to this image that is in perfect equilibrium. And the personality is constantly being pushed out of its imbalanced one-sidedness, mm -hmm. where the scale is weighted too much on one side, by the dream, which provides images, feelings, and thoughts, with the attempt to push the scale on the opposite direction, hopefully to at least move towards a kind of equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So in that very personal level, we're experiencing a kind of justice all the time. Sometimes it's hard to apply that when we experience massive misfortune, like a terrible illness or something awful happening to somebody we care about. But by extension, if we imagine that the microcosmic system of the psyche is connected to the macrocosmic or larger 
universe, there is some kind of a correlate that human beings intuit in terms of the ruthless demand to move back into equilibrium. Mm. So what I am taking from what you've said, Joseph, is that one way or another, it is critical that we take this matter of fairness and justice into ourselves. Our dreams may compensate for something um, that's bothersome and even perceived as unjust in the external world, a concept like karma, that there is a connection with the wider universe, but that it becomes a process internal to us rather than expecting uh, people out there or the world in general to be fair according to whatever any individual's ideas of fairness or justice are. And there's a story um, that Jung tells about himself in his uh, autobiography, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, uh, that he was a, a school kid, and if I'm remembering right, I think he was about 12, and he wrote an essay, and it was excellent. And the teacher said, you know, this was an outstanding essay um, by Carl Jung, but unfortunately, uh, he copied it from someplace else. And uh, the young, young Jung <laughs> was uh, horrified and outraged. He felt, uh, he said, branded. And he said, profoundly disheartened and dishonored, I swore vengeance on the teacher. And isn't that familiar to everybody? And then he said, again and again, I came to the conclusion that I was powerless, the sport of a blind and stupid fate that had marked me as a liar, and that what made me furious was that they should think me capable of cheating and thus morally destroy me. My grief and rage threatened to get out of control. And then he says, there was a sudden inner silence. And he says, I asked myself, what is really going on here? Hmm. All right, you are excited. Of course, the teacher's an idiot who doesn't understand your nature. That is, doesn't understand it any more than you do. He is as mistrustful as you are. And then Jung gets to the conclusion one gets excited when one doesn't understand things. So I think it's pretty remarkable that um, as a pre-adolescent, Jung could have that kind of internal process, and that maybe that's what happens is that we bump up against things we can't understand. Yeah, and then we want to control them somehow. Mm -hmm. I'm just back at what it would be like to have Carl Jung in your, you know, eighth grade class or something. <laughs> <Can you> imagine <laughs> he writes this paper and you're like, oh my God, where did this come from? <laughs> um, you know, I'm I'm thinking about about what it's like when we bump into what looks to us like injustice. Exactly. And again, Joseph, to build on what you said before, you know, at the level of the individual, it looks unjust. I'm thinking about, you know, Job. Mm -hmm. You know, God does what he does and sort of destroys Job's life. And God's like, you know, this is just the way it is. From the standpoint of the gods, you know, it's just another day. And, and Job, it seems horribly, horribly unjust. And when we're in that space, in some sense, we're having a hard time accepting the world as it is. And we want it to be what we think it should be. So, you know, the little kid that says, it's not fair. You know, a lot of parents get used to saying, well, life is not fair. Mm-hmm. I think most parents have probably said that at least once. And what we're trying to get at is, no, things things don't go just the way you think they should go. Whether it's about you and what you've gotten or not been given, or even injustices out there. And that's not to say that we can't work to make things more just. But at some point, too, there is a level of, 
and and this is how it is. This is maybe just how it is sometimes. And, and we have to accept what, you know, that there's some things that we can change and there may be other things we can't change. So there's something about being in a kind of innocence complex where we think the world should just be the way that we think it should be. And that the world should, just as you said, should be as we are conceiving of it. I mean, the world that we all live in when we're seven years old is limited by our consciousness. And so as we circumscribe our seven-year-old world, we have a feeling that we know how things should unfold. Mm -hmm. It's fair when this follows this. And then as we continue to mature and we understand, just as Jung um, was understanding, that there are so many more complicated dimensions, that there are forces that are moving through human beings and through circumstances, which we are not able to monitor off or at that moment that influence outcomes and compel or repel certain circumstances. And it's not until we have a full enough understanding that we could possibly see that there is a certain kind of equilibrium that is in fact present. And often we achieve this through science. It doesn't seem fair that a certain person should become ill and another person shouldn't. But when we rest into a more scientific perception, there are certain laws of hygiene, for instance, that have an inevitable circumstance, that bring an inevitable result that is not about rewarding or punishing, but are the natural consequences of an equilibrium in the natural world. There's a, an ancient Egyptian document called the Confession to Mat, where Mat, who was another god of truth and justice, would bring the soul into this judgment hall and in front of Osiris, the heart would be weighed against a feather, and the heart would have to be equal or lighter than the feather. And then the soul would memorize a kind of uh, declaration of their value and innocence. One of the last lines of the confession to Mott is, Therefore evil shall not befall me in this world, because I, even I, know the laws of God, which are God. And when we think about so many things that have happened to us that are full of misfortune, they're often the result of a kind of natural law that either we didn't know or we knew and we chose to not be in alignment with, which then cause sometimes an inevitable circumstance that we can feel victimized by, and yet it was an inevitable outcome sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes like terrible things happen for no reason. And, and then it's almost like we are being asked to accept that the sort of cosmic justice is beyond our understanding. So it seems like where this goes is to the need that each of us has for a kind of radical acceptance and the feeling function of, of grief that something terrible has happened, that something drastically unfair has happened. I'm thinking about, you know, literal things like people being uh, imprisoned uh, who are, in fact, innocent. Uh, and more of those are being brought uh, to light all the time. But also, you know, natural laws of illnesses and other things. And being able to grieve that as sad rather than framing it as if uh, it's unfair. You know, I have a, a personal story um, 
I am friends with someone whose mother, really quite out of the blue, committed suicide when when we were uh, in middle school. And I reconnected with this friend uh, during adulthood, and she had obviously done a lot of uh, real deep work about the loss of her mother and was discussing it with me. And she shared that they had become aware that her mother had been prescribed something shortly before the suicide, and one of the rare effects of this could be suicidality. And I was, you know, so at this point, I was probably, you know, in my 40s, it wasn't that long ago. And I was sort of horrified on her behalf. And, you know, oh, my God, did you get the medical records? And did you, you know, think about pressing charges or and she just looked at me very calmly. She said, you know, we'll never really know. And I, I just got it with this real sense of admiration for my friend that she had moved on from needing to uh, mete out justice for this terrible, terrible, unimaginable loss and just be in a place of acceptance with it in all of its complexity. It really underscores uh, for me how important uh, the feelings are. And we tend, I think, very often to bypass our feelings and uh, frame it as uh, a moral outrage or injustice and uh, take it to the, to the moral level. But if we don't do uh, what your friend did about the loss of her mother, we may ruminate on the injustice for a long time, harbor all kinds of resentment that, that keeps cooking in the past or, you know, go on some sort of righteous crusade against them, whoever they happen to be, to rectify this injustice and, and get mired in the past and just stuck there instead of being able to move on internally to the life we still can live. So this goes, Lisa, as you were inferring that we can be searching for justice. And I think that that was kind of the archetype that might have been evoked in you. Yes. It seemed unjust that uh, this woman was given incorrect medication or incorrect information about it and then caused her to go into a terrible state of mind and one could imagine that there is a relief, a kind of equilibration of suffering that the one who didn't inform or misprescribed will have to suffer a fate or make a compensation, and then an equilibration could occur, which equilibration leads generally to peace. When all forces are balanced, then there's kind of an exhalation that way. The question then comes, and I think we've all been in this circumstance, is do we personally have the libido to pursue the equilibrating justice and experience ourselves as part of the hand of justice? And I think many of us find ourselves in those moments. It's funny you brought that up. I had a very similar circumstance at my uh, father had just finished a dialysis session and was waiting in the um, waiting room of the clinic. And uh, they keep them there for a few minutes before they drive home. And within a few minutes right after that, he began to be, become septic. They kept him there for a long time, finally put him at the hospital. And long story short is within about two weeks, that had set off a cascade and he finally died mm. as a result of that. Mm. At the moment, in the grief, I couldn't, I couldn't even think that I should be going after this um, clinic for perhaps not uh, sterilizing his dialysis machine or not managing him in some way. But in the moment, I couldn't even wrap my head around that kind of justice energy in the midst of the grief mm. and the confusion about what had happened. And it wasn't until many years later that it finally occurred to me, actually, 
that there, there was some mistake had been made most likely and I should have pursued that or think I should have in mm-hmm. retrospect. It's a very confusing thing about whether or not one can hold the archetype of justice in every circumstance that might warrant it. Yeah. And it goes, I think, again, to that place of sort of human justice versus the divine justice, because, you know, certainly there are clearly cases where something remiss has happened. And, you know, and, and sort of holding the other person accountable feels both personally gratifying and also like we're contributing to the greater good because we're setting something right. I mean, I've been involved in, in, a, in a lawsuit like that. Like we did decide to um, hold someone accountable. So, I, you know, I, I, can, I can see the benefit of that and, and feel that um, and think it's totally legitimate. And sometimes terrible things happen that are out of anyone's control. And one thing we can do in those cases is convince ourselves that it could have been prevented that someone did make a mistake. And I'm not saying that this is true for you, Joseph. It's easier to sometimes feel outraged than to just feel grief Helpless. and out of control. Right. Well, and even in the legal system, they talk about acts of God, mm-hmm. which then fall out of the legal system or out of compensation because mm-hmm. the courts can't imagine that right. there being an intercession. And this, and this idea of the act of God can also become a, a palliative philosophy. Mm-hmm. I think about that phrase, and I don't know who to attribute it to. I look upon every circumstance of my life as a particular dealing of God with my soul, which is to move into that transcendent place to seek some kind of peace. I'm taking a step back into, um, you know, the tendency that we all have, you know, and what Jung said as a 12-year-old, that he was going to seek vengeance, uh, that we want to hold the other person accountable. And that that is an aspect of man's justice, is the retributive kind of justice, where, you know, our courts are busy all day, every day, with people who need to be punished as if that balances the scales. And it's a fine line, of course, of do we hold no one accountable for wrongs that are committed and should be addressed? And what is the psychological function of of punishment and feeling, uh, you know, good, you know, those are the bad guys and they're, I'm glad they're in jail. It is an aspect, a very human aspect of justice that has its own very real deep complications, as does your point, Joseph, about divine justice, and where is that psychologically in terms of a transcendence and realizing that the perception and the laws of man are one thing, and uh, that of the unknowable divine forces are another, or is it a defense against feeling one's feelings? You know, that's the matter that we have to take within ourselves. Is what is going on in me? And maybe all of those various scenarios are still crying out to have a peaceful equilibration to be restored, whether or not it's a monetary settlement that comes out through a legal case or whether it's a spiritual attitude that one adopts or everything in between, somewhere human beings are trying to move from this state of deep distress and suffering into a kind of balance Mm -hmm. where whatever has occurred can be held more softly and the individual lives can continue to move forward in some creative, reasonably positive way rather than being locked into the feeling of injustice or unfairness or pain that has, that has happened. You know, we've been talking about how uh, seeking justice, that's a place we can go to as a defense against feeling, but it can play other roles too. I mean, there can be secondary gain 
to seeking justice. And in fact, there's recent research that suggests that moral outrage, particularly on behalf of third parties, it's it's often a function of self-interest. And it assuages feelings of uh, personal responsibility for bad things going on in the culture. And it also reinforces our own status for ourselves and for others as a good person. It's incredibly seductive for us to want to see ourselves as virtuous and even as intrinsically aligned with the archetypal principles of virtue and justice. And how much damage I think that that does in the culture, but also how much damage that does in the individual. So central to Jung's work is the integration of shadow. And when we are possessed by the archetype of virtue, all shadow is outsourced to other people or other situations and then is attacked or somehow punished. And that creates a tremendous amount of dis-ease in the pseudo-virtuous person, which sooner or later all falls apart, by the way. I think that even though we can fool ourselves into thinking that we are paragons of virtue, something inside of us always knows when we're full of shit. And Jung was actually very interested in this. Of course, he spoke about it in more elegant terms. <laughs> um, and this comes up around his work with the complex and the word association test, that he noticed that as he would speak a series of words to somebody, that they could have a rather relaxed, easy response. They could find associations and memories, but sometimes they would get kind of locked up around it. And he would notice this by just timing their responses to his question or to his comment. But later on, as they began to use galvanic skin response machines, which Jung was also aware of later on, this became the genesis of the lie detector test, that when we are not congruent with ourselves, when we're not telling the truth, when the inner is not congruent with the outer, something inside of us knows that and locks up. And that locking up changes how the body functions and how the psyche functions. So it also suggests that there is something in us that knows about justice and honesty by extension and transparency and is monitoring for that. Yeah, and when we're behaving in a way that isn't fair or isn't in alignment with justice, we have a deep psychic reaction to that. I'm thinking about two literary works of art that explore that theme. One is Crime and Punishment, in which, you know, Raskolnikov, having killed the the old lady, you know, really begins to to kind of crack under the weight of what he's done. And then, of course, we also see that in Macbeth, and Lady Macbeth in particular, cannot uh, kind of come back from having uh, aided and abetted her husband in uh, killing the king. And Joseph, I believe you have a story. Yes, um, talking about hiding from justice. Uh, I was probably about five years old, and uh, for some reason at that age, my father became really interested in taking me to work with him. And uh, he was uh, a designer, and he also worked with a fabric house, and he would do installations in people's homes. He wanted to take me to work. He wanted to introduce me to his world. And at five years old, of course, I didn't have much to say about it or had a hard time understanding it. But uh, we were living in Long Island, and many of his clients were in Manhattan. So one weekend, we all kind of got dressed up, he and I, and he took me into Chinatown to one of his clients' homes. And it was this very opulent apartment, and Dad was kind of uh, talking about his design business. And sitting there in the living room, there was a kumquat bush, uh, which looked like a tiny little orange tree to me. And I was fascinated by it. I'd never seen such a thing. 
And my father had said, you know, don't touch anything. We have to go into the other room. And they're kind of looking at some things, taking some measurements. So, of course, as soon as everybody left the room, <laughs> I touched one of the kumquats, which then immediately <laughs> fell off the tree. So, in a state of horror, because I had done something unjust, I had broken the rule, I stuck the kumquat in my pocket and then continued to sit on the couch. And over the next several <laughs> minutes, the kumquat broke open and began to leak. So this enormous stain started <laughs> spreading across the side of my thigh, which was horrifying. And I think I remember even being concerned that people would have thought that I had urinated in my pants. So I excuse myself and I slink over into the bathroom and I'm desperately trying to figure out how to dry this and how to escape the revelation of my infraction. Mm -hmm. And so I'm in there for about a half hour desperately <laughs> trying to dry this spot out on my pants. So of course my father and the people's homes there are starting to get concerned. So now they're like knocking on the door, <laughs> asking for me to come out and if I'm okay. <laughs> and much like Adam and Eve being cast out of the Garden of Eden, I am just crippled with shame at mm. this stain like Lady Macbeth that <laughs> out cannot, out damn spot. <laughs> yes, that can't come out of my pants. Uh, and for some reason, it just evokes this whole feeling about justice and balance and breaking the rules and breaking the law and having this inevitable stain mm -hmm. on oneself and the desperation even at five to hide that. Yeah. Just that recognition that you had transgressed and couldn't it couldn't be undone. It couldn't be undone. Mm -hmm. That's quite right. Mm -hmm. The last thing that I might want to just bring up is the kind of um, the shift in mythology around the idea of justice. And one of the things that I was thinking about is how the early gods and goddesses of justice were almost always associated with the scale. But then over time, two other symbolic elements were added. And one was the sword, and the other was the blindfold. So the sword can be interpreted in a number of different ways. Conventionally, it's often interpreted as severe punishment, that the sword meets out a kind of lethal justice to those who violate the law of equilibrium. On a more philosophical level, if we ourselves are dedicated to a life of balance, that we have to wield our own swords to cut away those ideas, behaviors, even possessions that are keeping us from being in a reasonably equilibrated state. So the cutting away of something becomes part of the realm of justice. And in our modern society, justice being blindfolded is again an important evolution where the human suffering that is inevitable as justice is meted out, is not to be a consideration. That the judge must be blind to the suffering that the perpetrator will then experience as a result of their malfeasance. Right, so there's a way that you have to tuck empathy away and hew to this principle. What does one have to become blind to, or what does... What do the gods have to become blind to in order to mete out a justice that is based solely on principle, solely on logic? That is a rather new appearance in the history of humankind. One might say that it engenders a kind of fairness, which we were talking about, that everyone is subject to these same rules and everybody is subject to the same punishments around it. And in that way, justice becomes a more abstract and aloof kind of God, massively indifferent to human suffering. 
But I think in more ancient times, when justice was beholding its actions and repercussions, the sword and the blindfold weren't there, and there was some kind of a tempering quality to the meeting out of justice. And I think that there is something chilling about that evolution of the blindfold. I'm not sure that human beings were designed to be subject to pure, abstract ideas that are divorced from the complexity of the human psyche and the human soul and the complexity of conditions that we find ourselves in. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're asking is, if justice is truly of the gods, if it resides initially and fundamentally in the archetypal realm, then any efforts that we make as humans to create systems of justice, meet justice out, make these decisions, are inevitably imperfect ones, and that we're, we're trying to approximate something that exists outside of the human realm, essentially. We're never going to be able to do that perfectly. And I think this struggle is trying to emerge in the religious imagery of Christianity, that this movement from the Old Testament and the law and the word, which was so paramount to civilization, actually, at that time, and movement towards this different image of the self or divinity in the image of Jesus being a God who can forgive, who can know what is true, and also come to an equilibration of forces through mercy and through forgiveness. And that also is a very new evolution in terms of the human psyche. So what this leads me to is uh, the idea, which is very inherent in Jungian thought, of humanizing the archetypes, that the archetypes themselves are distant and inhuman by definition. But what we try to do is to bring them as much as possible into consciousness and into awareness as the Greeks had it, to know that we are not that, we are not God, so we cannot arrogate a godlike power to ourselves. And then how do we deal as imperfect humans at the forces of natural law and all kinds of incomprehensible things to combine the ideals, concepts, moralities, principles of fairness and justice with compassion and with awareness of our own shadows. We are that also. And to remember that uh, here in the human realm, uh, we cannot arrogate these archetypal powers of justice to ourselves. And there are different gods between justice and vengeance, they are related that the god Themis does have a kind of relationship to the humanities that hunt down those who commit matricide and, and devour them. But they are quite different, and I think that there is a great confusion of this in our culture right now. We're in an enormous tumult around the ideas of justice what is justice? What is harm? What is vengeance? What is an appropriate response to various things? And we're seeing this strange monstrosities rising up, destroying someone's career because of a post they put on Facebook several years earlier, or that their spouse posted several years earlier will cost somebody a career somebody has to beg for forgiveness because of an embarrassing photograph that was taken when they were 17. I mean, the gods of vengeance 
and excruciating punishment are running rampantly, which also means they're moving unconsciously through the culture, that there isn't enough thought about what is an appropriate equilibrating action when something has moved out of balance. And there is a great disservice when a disproportionate vengeance is meted because the scales are once again thrown out of balance and there's going to be another kind of reaction. It won't be sustainable. Maybe this is a time to transition into a dream. Hey, Lisa, what's been going on about your book? Well, it was released on May 25th, and sales have been strong. And I've been receiving so many lovely emails and texts and phone calls from from friends and from uh, people that I don't know telling me how much they've enjoyed the book. And so that feels really great. The reviews on Amazon have all been glowing, and that's been really heartening. It's just really wonderful to know that this project of mine is resonating with so many people. I'm just uh, so happy for you. And it's such a lovely, lovely book, both deep and accessible, about the inner journey around being a mother. It's never been, that's never been written about. It hasn't been out there. And that it's getting such an enthusiastic, heartfelt reception. That's wonderful. Yeah. I would love it if listeners who've read the book could write a review on Amazon because (laughs) although there are many wonderful ones there, um, more is always better. So thanks in advance for that. You've really incarnated something that was in the ethers, but needed to be pulled down, needed to be shaped in words, and needed to be made accessible. And the proof in the pudding is that it's beginning to have a kind of life of its own in the collective. <laughs> yes. That speaks a lot to the timeliness of this. Yeah, I think they're right, too. The, the analogy to a baby is just too rich and too good and too multifaceted to be <laughs> missed. <laughs> it's having a life of its own, which yeah. is just what we want. Today's dream comes from a woman who's 34 years old, and she's a counselor. And here's the dream. I stood opposite my husband as he told me he'd found somewhere else to live and with a mystery woman. I paced around. We were in a busy place. I reached for my phone, unsure who to phone or text. I felt panic as I realized I'm not sure who I could rely on, aware of a sense of burden. I didn't have a job yet. How would I support myself and our children? In the dream, I was aware there was a separation, and it felt as if I had instigated it in order for him to realize our marriage was worth saving. However, him moving on so swiftly made me feel as if I'd made a huge mistake. As I returned home, my neighbor had invited me to a cafe to talk. I felt hungry and junk food was placed in front of me. She wanted the gossip. I felt the urge to share, but knew everyone would soon know about my husband leaving. And here's the context she provides. We have just sold our home as we plan on moving to a bigger one. There have been thoughts in my mind about where our marriage is headed, a sense of wanting to leave, but also knowing that I'm not financially in a position to do so. When I have these dreams, and I have many dreams where he cheats, he disowns me, he tells me he's leaving, ignores me, dislikes me. Never have I ever had a positive, loving, caring husband dream, which feels significant. I'm aware of how I am left feeling when I wake up. And the main feelings in the dream were sadness, shame, fear, hopelessness, emptiness, despair, depression, anger, frustration, and confusion. And finally, she says, the way in which he always leaves me in dreams, it's always in a busy surrounding. There's always too much going on. Lots of people or things moving or getting in the way. It always feels chaotic. I think this is a really interesting dream to lift up this issue of objective versus subjective. 
is this a dream about the inner world? Or is it a dream that says something about the outer world? And of course, it can be both. It's interesting, Lisa, I had uh, exactly the same question in my mind, especially because of the beginning of the dream, I stood opposite my husband. So there's immediately a separation, uh, a polarity um, and opposition. That's if we look at it as about her internal world, that the husband in the internal world is somewhere else. He's found another place to live with a mystery woman. And I found myself immediately curious to know more about this internal world uh, aspect of herself that we would call the animus or the inner other. Uh, but there's also a shadow mystery woman here. Although there may be difficulties in the marriage and in the partnership, and both are true, I found myself pulled into the internal woman and wanting to know more about who these dream figures are in our dreamer. If I were to join you in that internal lens, Deb, and then I would see the husband as an anonymous figure or as a symbol of her spirit, and that the ego and the spirit are somehow in a difficult, uh, problematic relationship. But the husband, the inner husband, has found a mystery woman, ostensibly, that he prefers. I see this dream very frequently in, in men as well, where a man is looking at his girlfriend or his wife, and the girlfriend or wife is compellingly involved with another man in the dreamscape. How I'll generally interpret it and how I will hear, is that the mystery woman in the dream represents her shadow, and that there's another part of the woman that she's not in touch with, that her inner spirit is in fact more interested in than the well-known ego state. Now, this could also positively influence the marriage, it could very well be that this disowned part of herself could have a vitalizing or revivifying effect on the relationship with the husband and with the marriage, as often does happen when we bring in something we've lost. She doesn't speak a lot about the mystery woman other than mentioning it in the first sentence, but I feel like that's a compelling piece that she could explore perhaps even going in and talking with the inner husband and asking him to introduce her to the mystery woman so that she could have some kind of a connection there. I think there's a telling uh, sentence here, too. That it, she says, In the dream, I was aware there was a separation which I felt I had instigated. And then the dream ego says, well, it was in order to motivate him to save the marriage. And then she says, him moving on so swiftly. So something in the psyche is moving swiftly. And what I'm thinking about is what a huge divide there may be here between the dream ego, which often represents our waking life sense of self, and the deeper layers of psyche. And the dream ends with um, the neighbor at home inviting her to a cafe to talk. And the dream ego says, I was hungry and junk food was placed in front of me and the neighbor wanted to gossip. So it seems that the resolution of the dream is in this outer world at the level of cafe, chit chat, gossip, junk food. And so I'm picking up on your point, Joseph, which I think was uh, really well said, of to see if you could dialogue with the inner husband and use that dream image as a bridge to the shadow mystery woman. I mean, it might be easier to do the act of imagination with the mystery woman because dialoguing with an inner husband might 
bring up, <laughs> it might be difficult to separate from your actual husband. But I, I think I really like the track that both of you are on. And of course, this image of I'm hungry and I'm only fed junk food. You know, it speaks to what you said, Joseph, about her being kind of not in right relationship with her own spirit, that there isn't nourishment that's on offer. And and in fact, some part of the psyche is only interested in these kind of juicy, salacious details about this impending breakup, when really there's there's grief that kind of doesn't have a place to go. So it would be interesting to know what what the dreamer experiences in the outer marriage. And we really have no information about that. And again, both of these levels can and often are true at the same time. So whatever we're saying about the inner relationship probably has some kind of corollary or bearing upon the outer relationship, but it does feel somehow as though uh, she knows something is is amiss in the dream. And she's, she's tried to take this action by sort of saying, well, we're going to split up. And then he kind of calls her bluff. So somehow there's an effort on the part of the ego to shift something in this inner relationship. It isn't perhaps uh, done correctly. It isn't done uh, taking into account that mystery woman and whatever it is she brings, because that mystery woman brings the missing elements. And it, it, to me, it's interesting because the mystery woman almost seems to be sort of there's a counterpoint there with the woman that she meets in the cafe, who's only interested in these very superficial things. So somehow both of those are maybe in shadow a little bit. And it may be that, you know, if I were this dreamer, I might act, ask myself, how am I behaving like that neighbor woman in the cafe? How am I only interested in these superficial, uh, salacious details? How am I ignoring my own nourishment? How am I turning my suffering into a trite story for the delectation of others? Or for the arousal of herself, that when she says... There was a separation which felt as if I had instigated in order for him to realize our marriage was worth saving. So this idea that many of us can fall into, instead of cultivating relationship, we try to provoke relationship. And provoking relationship suddenly can become its own kind of exciting drama, its exciting gossip point. And the provocation can replace a deep felt sense of connection. Now one could argue maybe the felt sense of connection is missing for multiple reasons, which could be on both sides, both she and her husband. But here the dream is really confronting her at this moment that are you barking up the wrong tree, frankly? And just as Lisa was saying, is can you cultivate a more profound search for something that is sustaining rather than titillating. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.